Hi everybody and welcome to this first glimpse at the gameplay of Dune Awakening. I'm really excited to welcome you into our world, but I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, this is a beta, it's beta footage, so you'll see bugs and you'll see things that need polish still. And secondly, our tutorialization is still a work in progress. With that said, let's get into it. The start of the game, Dune Awakening, begins off-world on this large spaceship. Show yourself, child. It is here, in the presence of the Reverend Mother, the character creation begins. Now the first thing you'll do is choose your preset avatar. Some of these are heavily inspired by the Denis Villeneuve movies. Once you've chosen a base visual look, you can then move into the depths of character creation and make choices about how your character feels, both in terms of age, but also a plethora of physical attributes. Our goal in giving players access to a detailed character creator is to really allow them to create the avatar that lets them fulfill their fantasy of living out their dreams on Arrakis. There are a multitude of hairstyles. And other things such as tattoos for players to choose from. You can even choose different styles of lipstick and eyeshadow. Choose the muscle tone of your character from height, arm thickness, leg thickness, neck length. And once you finish your character, you choose your name and enter the world. And once you've customized the avatar that you want to play in the game, Have they told you well, then we I move am? into the second phase of character creation. Then I will sift your words for lies. Let's begin. Where were you born? The second phase of character creation a world of is where water, you, as a person who may or may not know anything about Dune, get to make choices about who you were before the game starts. Where you come you from, bad what caste you belong to in the Dune universe, and of course, perhaps most importantly, who your mentor age. was. Who was your mentor? Your mentor determines your starting set of skills when you enter the game. Hmm. You must have been very young. The mind must be prepared or the training does not take. The test is almost complete. Have you spoken truth? Come here. Kneel. Put your hand in the box. Hold at your neck the Gonjaba, the high-handed enemy. Don't pull away or you will die. Great plots are afoot in the Imperium, and the currents of intrigue run deeply. Arrakis is the key, and the Fremen... The Fremen are missing. You will go to Arrakis as our agent prisoner. You have one task. Find the Fremen. Wake the Sleeper. You will know when it is done. Now we're going to jump ahead a little bit in the story here. Uh, skipping past several events just to sort of get uh, into the early new player experience of the game. And you'll see that the player after various shenanigans, wakes up here, in a cave. And as we sort of look around the cave, we'll notice that it's filled with Fremen and uh, the remnants of, you know, this ancient culture.
So now as the player takes their first steps in the world, they're really here amongst the dead. And so the first question they should be asking is, what happened here? Who are these people? And, you know, this is just a place where we give players a little bit of time to adjust their settings, get a feel for the movement keys, and then move forward into the cave. And they'll stumble upon their first major interaction point, which is the Frem Kit. The Frem Kit in our game serves as both a, a backpack for the player, of course, but also really a guide. Um, the Fremen used to pack these with interesting objects that they could use to survive in the desert, and it's no different from the player. So here they begin their first crafting experience, crafting a small scrap knife out of metal that was in the Frem Kit. These caves have been moisture sealed uh, in order to preserve the moisture of those within the cave. And so the player, as they explore, will be able to use their scrap metal knife to pierce the seals and escape. So really this entire area, built using Unreal Engine 5, is just to sort of get the player and ease them into the path. A lot of survival games have very abrupt, very harsh beginnings, and we tried to you know, make the experience of joining June Awakening just a little easier, just give people a little bit of a feel for the world before we really toss them out into the harshness that is the desert of Arrakis. So here we've crafted a heal kit, and we're going to use that to heal our character. And once we're healed, you'll see that our stamina bar in the bottom left appears. And now that we have stamina, we can climb. The climbing system in June Awakening is based in part on the one that we built for Conan Exiles. It's a free-form climbing system. It can be used to climb almost anywhere. And as you'll see later, the new technology available in Dune Awakening, such as suspensor belts, allows us to do even more interesting things with traversal. So once we've finished that first little section, we're jumping ahead, we're going straight into the harsh real world of Arrakis. And here are your first steps on Arrakis. Your ornithopter has crashed, and you've got to escape from the crash site immediately, because the sandworm always comes. And what you have to keep in mind is, these are the little ones. So these are the first sandworms you encounter in the game. There's bigger ones later on. The other thing that you have to pay attention to as a player is sunstroke and heat. So if you see in the top middle of the UI here, we've got this sunstroke bar building up. The longer you stay in the sunlight, the more chance you have of getting into the sunstroke state. And of course, our player here, not the sharpest knife in the drawer, has decided to stay in the sun and try harvesting water from plants. So he has become sunstroked. Sunstroke gives you a debuff. It means that your water goes down much faster than it normally would. That means you'll need to drink more often. So stick to the shadows avoid the sun. It will eventually wear off if you stay in shade long enough. So now that we've made our way out of the first part of the desert and we're heading deeper in, we're going to start to harvest in the game world. So harvesting in a lot of these survival games is quite similar. In this case, we're picking up items, but we're about to pull out what's known as the cut array. And what we do with the cut array is we analyze structures to find their weak points and then we cut along those lines to break open the structures and gain the resources inside. This is like mining, we, uh, we apply it both to rocks, we apply it to metals in the game world. And at the start of the game as a player, you'll just be scrounging around, picking up, you know, finding structural weak points in rocks that you can harvest, breaking them apart and taking those pieces with you. Now we've jumped ahead a little bit, and we see that the player is starting to be affected by the spice in the air. And this means that players need to get somewhere safe in shelter before the spice overwhelms them and overwhelms their senses. And this is a, another large part of the game, we're not going to show too much of it today, but spice is a very important part. With the world broken apart by the War of Assassins, there are NPC bases scattered all over Arrakis. We're switching to a different character now, one who's slightly more advanced, and he's using his binoculars to mark an NPC outpost. I'm going to mark that. That marker will then appear on our compass, and you're able to approach them in any way you like. In this case, our character uses a shiga wire claw combined with a suspensor belt to get up to high ground and approach the enemy base from above. 
kind of one of the interesting things about Dune Awakening is just how you can combine the different abilities. And this is how traversal really plays into the game. Like, you end up being able to attack these bases from any angle that you'd like. Now, our player is going to craft the first gun in the game, known as a Mauler Pistol, which translates to, you know, the basic kind of weapon in the game. As you may know, in Dune, bullets are not the preferred type of ammunition. Instead, it's darts, which are fired at a slower rate in order to try and attempt to pierce shields. Now, this early in the game, enemies don't really have shields, so the player is going to sneak into the base from above and use a combination of their early abilities. In this case, dropping out a grenade, then sneaking around the corner and beginning to get into NPCs head-on. Now, troopers are the basic shock troops of the universe, and their ability trees reflect that. Grenades, shiga wire claws for moving around, and of course, they're able to take down people with headshots. You can see how suspensor belts really allow you to change your approach to combat. Dune Awakening is at heart a third person shooter with melee and abilities. And it's the combination of melee, abilities and range shooting that creates what we call combined arms in the game. Now we've taken a fair bit of damage in this battle. So we're going to stop for a second to heal ourselves up with a bandage. Bandages heal over time, so you can't just heal yourself to 100%. You have to actually get into safety, get behind cover, before you start using them. Now we're going to quickly switch to a slightly different character to show off more of the melee that we have in the game. Because you're about to see that when a character gets in close, it's melee time. This character has sword master abilities. First of all, the knee charge, which is about getting in close to do damage in combat. And then quickly setting up to a riposte, which allows you to parry and return massive amounts of damage to your enemy. Of course, later in the game, when enemies have shields, melee is a much more emphasized style of combat. And you see that when a player is not really equipped to handle range characters, they have to fall back on their abilities to get in close. Now, we've switched again. Now we're going to switch to a set of Mentat abilities. One of these abilities is known as Battlefield Calculation. Using Battlefield Calculation, the Mentat is able to calculate from anybody that they see what they're carrying and what they're wearing. I don't like the sound of that. Now we've dropped out our Hunter Seeker, and we're using our Hunter Seeker ability to take down enemies in the world really quickly. You hear that? Now obviously when you're playing with a friend, you want to combine your abilities and work together. In this case, the Mentat's able to point out to their friend where people are in the world and how much ammo and stuff they have. And you'll see that when enemies go down sometimes, they go into a down but not out state. It's up to you whether you execute them or continue to fight. After a quick reload, it's back into the battle with our friend coming from above and throwing out one more grenade. And once you've defeated your enemies in battle, sometimes you just gotta take their blood. In order to get water, the player's going to ha have to craft themselves this blood sack and this blood extractor and use it to harvest blood from their fallen enemies. Now, in, in our game, it's not always a good thing to just take blood from people. It's potentially bad and can only be used for certain things. Once you've extracted the blood, you can then of course drink it, as you'll see here. The player takes a big sip from their blood bag. But when they do that, it causes a debuff because the blood is not exactly pure and drinking blood for water is not exactly a one-to-one -one scenario. So you'll see that our health bar got shorter while our water bar went up. And so being a blood drinker is not always looked upon in the right way. Of course, once you've played the game for a little while, you'll start wanting to build your own base. And the first part of that is placing down what we call a sub-fief console. A sub-fief console allows you to claim a small part of Arrakis as your own. But it does in turn mean that you'll start to owe taxes to the Emperor. So, here we are with our 
building system. And you can see that we have two types of building here. We have the holograms, which show in the beginning. I call them Solido projections internally. And we have the way that you fill in, which is by holding down the mouse button in this case. So the cool thing about this is it allows us to have this cooperative building system. So you'll see that one player places out the Solido projections and the other player fills them in with the materials from their inventory. This is just a way that lets people play together and build together in an interesting and exciting way. We've seen through our experience with Conan Exiles that some people just love to build in these games. So we've created a system called the Blueprint Building System that allows players to save a copy of their base as one of these giant holographics. Then they can take them out into the world and place them out wherever they like and then rebuild. And we have another system in the game which allows you to take these you know, big architectural designs of your buildings and sell them to other players on the exchange. Once again, this is a way to quickly move your base around the world. If you've got a design you like, you don't have to you know, throw it out immediately. And it allows you to create these interesting masterpieces. It also, as you can see here, allows you to, you know, if you're not artistically minded and you don't like building big bases, you can buy them from other players. Once you finish crafting a base, you want to fill it with all kinds of machines, fabricators, and refineries. And of course, hearkening back to the blood extraction we just did, we've got the blood purifier. So what we want to do is take the blood from our blood sack and deposit it into the blood purifier. And over time, it will refine into lovely fresh water, which can then extract into our litigons and carry with us out into the desert. While there's many varieties of fabricators that you can use to craft things in the game, one of the most exciting things is crafting yourself a vehicle. So we're opening the technology menu, and from here, we're able to purchase the design for a sandbike. A sandbike is one of the early vehicles available to players in the game. And you can kit it out with different types of modules, including an extra seat, which allows you to bring your friends with you. So in this menu, you can see we're fabricating ourselves a sandbike. And all the different parts of the sandbike have to be fabricated individually. So the player is going into the menu here, they're crafting different things which will make up their sandbike. And as you can see, it prints out in this kind of 3D printer type way where all the materials are turned into these particles which then come together to form the different pieces of the sandbike. And you can see it's sort of all happening in the background here. And if we go out into the world view, you can actually see the pieces forming up inside the fabricator. So a base with lots of these fabricators going is actually pretty cool and pretty busy. Once we've done, we jump back in, we pull things out of the queue, chuck them into our inventory, and then we use the welding tool to place out vehicle pieces. Now again, this is a cooperative activity. We've thought about multiplayer, so any other player could be working with you to place modules and pieces of this bike. And so we're going to assemble this bike, but of course when you work on larger vehicles and your friends are with you, you'll be able to work together to craft big things like transport ornithopters or sand crawlers. And so we're going to add the body to this and we're going to add an extra seat just in case we want to bring our friend with us out into the world. Once the bike's been assembled and fueled up, you jump on and you can head out to explore the greater areas of Arrakis. Heading out into the world to explore can be a dangerous experience. And as you explore the universe, you'll find certain dynamic events will occur. In this case, the War of Assassins has claimed a new victim, a ship which falls from the sky, spilling its loot all over the sand. So we head out there to see what we can get, to harvest and gather as much as we can. Of course, the problem is, this is extremely visible to everybody in the nearby area. So people will be able to see this. And so in a PvP area, you might f suddenly find yourself coming into competition with other players. In a PvE area, you might just find other people competing with you to get to the loot first. And of course, at night time, there are different kinds of threats. Because while the heat of the day is dangerous, at night, the Sardaukar patrol this area of the desert with huge spotlights 
searching for players. Now this player is over here, harvesting dew with a dew reaper, sucking the water off the surface of these plants. And they've been captured and seen by the Sardaukar. And the Sardaukar send down troops who come floating down out of the sky to attack and destroy the players. Now, of course, as mentioned, traveling on the surface at any time risks drawing a sandworm. But there are certain things which we've created to draw players out of their comfort zones. So in this case, there's a special type of sand here on the surface known as flower sand. Flower sand, according to the books, is the softest kind of sand. And players can use it to refine it into a variety of different materials that they need for crafting. So you want to come out into the desert and you want to try and find flower sand but you have to be wary and pay attention because as you harvest you risk drawing the attention of the sandworm we've awoken the beast the sandworm is coming we spent too much time out here and it's coming to get us now you can see in the middle of the screen the indicator showing us that the sandworm is angry and it's coming after us. And our only option now is to get back to rocky ground or the sandworm's going to take us. I don't know how those guys survived that, but somehow they managed to get to the safety of the rock island. Once you've crafted your first ornithopter, you'll be able to take to the air and your entire perspective of the world shifts. From here, it'll make traversing the world a lot safer because you can avoid the sandworms. It'll also help you to go out into the larger world of Arrakis. Here we are in the Overland map. And we're going to make our way south until we find the place known as Harko Village. Harko Village is the current seat of the Harkonnen after their city, Carthag, was destroyed in a nuclear explosion during the War of Assassins. There's more details like that in the lore of the game for players to discover and explore. So we're going to land at Harko, and we're going to explore the social space. Once you arrive in Harko Village, you'll be able to meet up with other players, interact with them, trade, and create guilds. The game has a variety of social interaction mechanics, from emotes, to grouping, to a chat. Throughout Harko Village, you'll also interact with story characters, follow the main story. You'll be able to meet vendors who will sell you exotic items. They let you live. That is interesting. You'll be able to get a feel for how the factions are viewed in the world, and of course, you'll be able to swear allegiance to one of the major factions, the Harkonnen or the Atreides. Swear your guild's allegiance and begin to take parts in the politics of the Imperium. Once you've grouped up with friends, you should go out into the world and find desert Imperial testing stations. These are dungeon-like experiences, which you and your friends can work through together. So, here we are landing our various ornithopters outside of one of the desert testing stations and we're going to head in as a group. Now it's really important to prepare different skills and abilities. These areas tend to be more of a challenge and it's great to work together to complement each other. So this is the skill tree. Here you can equip different types of abilities and techniques. We have three slots for abilities and three slots for techniques. And there are multiple different trees depending on the type of trainers that you've interacted with in the world. So our character here is going to equip a series of abilities that complements the rest of their group. In this case, Swordmaster Techniques. Alright, so we're heading in. And of course you can use suspensor belts to traverse, as you'd expect. And we're going to explore this Imperial Testing Lab. You've entered Desert Botanical Testing Station number 163. I'm Dr. Wen Olmeka, senior plant geneticist here at the station. Testing stations have storylines as well as enemies to fight and loot to be found. 
So you really want to go in here and enjoy the experience. Playing through with friends, working together, using different weapons and trying out different techniques. Now this player has placed out a portable cover. It's a different ability to what we've seen before. And you see that the enemies here have shields. Using the flamethrower, it's easy to get through a shield because you can burn the air around them. Now, of course, our characters are a little higher level than they were in the start of this video. So you're able to see that, uh, yeah, we can take people down a little more easily. And of course, when you get to the end of these areas, you find these really cool loot chests. And in these loot chests, you find specialized components that are used for crafting exotic weapons and items. The end game of Dune Awakening takes place in the deep desert. Giant spice blows will happen, drawing players from all around to try and harvest the spice as quickly as possible. You want to get there first, and you want to try and take as much spice as you can before an enemy guild shows up to try and take it away from you. Now, of course, if you're clever and you start to lose the battle, you might place out a thumper. And that limits the time in which people are able to take spice because then the big worm is going to show up. I hope you've enjoyed this brief glimpse at the gameplay of Dune Awakening. And we're really excited to have you join us when the game releases. <laughs>